This episode of Registry Matters is supported by our patrons. FYP. Recording live from FYP Studios, transmitting across the internet, this is episode 109 of Registry Matters. It's 7 o'clock outside, Larry. It's the sun's out. It's a great afternoon to be recording a podcast. And how are you? 7 o'clock. What, what city are you in again? I'm, I'm in Hawaii. I see. All right. It's, uh, it's about quarter to 11 my time. We are, we are way, we are almost four hours past our normal time. Well, it, it's had one positive effect. The, the, the chat room's empty. <laughs> you don't like all the distractions, do you? <laughs> so so we, we can get down to business really quickly. And, and Will, Will has announced himself that he is here. He is the only dedicated, loyal podcast listener fan who is contributing wildly to the success of the podcast here. How did he know that we were going to be here at this hour? Because actually he was already in chat and I uh, made a little announcement in chat that we were going to start soon. So he popped in. I see. I bought myself a little Christmas present and I upgraded my podcast gear. So I'm excited. I'm using a new microphone for the first time. It sounds stellar. Alston, do you actually hear a difference? Uh, it's not perceptible at the moment, but I'll let you know as we go through. <laughs> So I spent $18 million to upgrade my gear and you don't notice a difference. All right. That's cool. Well, we'll, we'll be able to tell better as we go through the podcast. If we don't yeah, hear well, that I'm popping not, and crack, crackling that, that, and snack pop, pop. What was it? Snap, crackle, pop, rice krispies. Yeah. Snap, crackle, pop. Yeah. I'm not, th this won't fix that. That's something else that happens. And no, you listeners out there, you won't hear it. Cause I do a different kind of recording. Anyway, we should get moving along. Did you have a good new year, by the way? Well, I was in the peach state, so we, we was watched... It, was the, it a peachy new year? We watched the peach uh, be dropped, uh, lowered. You, wait, where did they drop a peach? Somewhere in, in downtown Atlanta. Oh, okay, because they, they do... they do <laughs> In my town, they do... it. Wait, I can't... No, I'm, never mind. I'm going to say it, because then people know where I live. All right, I'm not going to say it, but I'll tell you about it later. Oh, you know what? Somebody brought up from the previous episode, I said, Larry, we needed to talk about the hovercraft, and we never came back to it. I remembered that you said that, and then we were so long on that one, I didn't bring it yeah. up again. But yes, the hovercraft is, it's always important to talk about the hovercraft. Yeah. So I, but I, you know, I wasn't really anywhere in the window when I was up uh, traveling uh, at uh, Thanksgiving. I was like within an hour or so. So like I could see over the horizon, the, the hovercraft was poised, but I left the state way long before it. So there was no, there was no threat of hovercraft. So, so it's within an hour. That's when the hovercraft emerges. You would think, I mean, they have to know that you are approaching, you know, all the states have their different kind of timelines of when, why you're allowed to be in there. So they know from the moment you arrived, from the moment that you are leaving, they're going to be poised with their uh, hovercraft and their GPS plotters and trackers. And you can like see it on their little video screens with a red box, like a hot box going into it, getting ready to shoot some sort of drone missile at you. Yeah, so, uh, that's what's I, happening. I thought they would just beam you up. Like an alien abduction? Yeah, and put you in custody and say, we, we, we've we got you. <laughs> well, let's move on on this show. We, uh, we have an outstanding, exciting episode for you, as we always do here at Registry Matters. And the first thing, uh, someone wrote in a handful of days ago, uh, Stephen wrote in from Pennsylvania, said he recently reviewed the case out of Pennsylvania, and he listens to the podcast, which is most helpful. I believe one important aspect that is most often overlooked in PA is the reputation effect. This makes PA a very unique state, which uh, comes to internet broadcasting of registrants past convictions. I don't recall you mentioning this very important finding in this and other PA cases. And he did an analysis and uh, I think we cover the case though, back around October, whatever, but um, did we cover this aspect of it? The the case we're talking about is is uh, Commonwealth versus Moore, which is before the Pennsylvania Supreme Court now. But for those who don't live in Pennsylvania, they adopted their version to comply with Adam Walsh in 2011, and it became effective in de December 2012. And subsequently, in 2017, in Commonwealth versus Munez, the Supreme Court of the state said that you can't apply this retroactively. Well, to a lot of consternation to folks when they asked me what they were what would be the result of that and I said well first of all they will ask for reconsideration then they'll file a cert petition to the Supreme Court of the United States they did those things and they, the Supreme Court refused to hear the case but then I said they will try to legislate a remedy that will restore as much as sorna of the previous as they can 
because every legislative enactment is presumed constitutional. Well, that's in fact what they did. They adopted SORNA II. And they have two subchapters. They have the chapter that applies to the people that were convicted after 2012. And then they have the subchapter that applies to before 2012. And they conveniently, in, in the reenactment, they put the internet, res- uh, the internet restrictions, they put the, uh, the internet notification, the website part, they reenacted it essentially the way it was when it was decided in, in, in Bunez that that was one of the components that rendered it to be punitive. So this was nothing more than, if you look through all my highlights, the, the, uh, the appellate level court continuously refers to what they feel that they were obligated to do based on the decision in Commonwealth versus Bunez, that they said that they could not discern any difference in what was done uh, what what then re- reinstating what had they had previously been de- declared unconstitutional, therefore they feel felt bound to find that this applying uh, re- reinstituting this was unconstitutional. Well, ultimately find out from the uh, f- from the state supreme court when they rule. But uh, but this is this is something where I don't I don't see any reference to the reputational clause that he says is in the constitution. Uh, they do talk about rep- reputation, but they don't they don't refer to a constitutional uh, a, a provision anywhere that I've spotted in this 22 page opinion. But they do several times over and over again say that that their hands were tied, that that that, uh, that the Supreme Court had already ruled on this issue and the legislature just simply put back into place what had been declared unconstitutional. So therefore, they, they're declaring it unconstitutional again. Can I like so we we've ta- I know that we've talked about because this isn't like new information to me we've talked about this reputation thing before being a unique property to Pennsylvania similar to the enhanced disabilities what's the word that they use for the Maryland Constitution that's unique to Maryland disadvantages disadvantages all right so no other state has this like quote unquote reputation thing in their constitution well well i haven't seen it in the pennsylvania constitution either but but assuming that it's there then we'll take his word for it and his analysis that that there is such a provision in the constitution but but like i said i haven't i haven't seen it wouldn't having your your you know your business presented on a website that tells you it says that you know 30 years ago you did something naughty and i mean doesn't that create a reputation uh whatever like some some sort of mark against your reputation well it does but but that that conflicts with uh, hundreds of years of tradition that criminal records are already public so the supreme court yeah. and smith and smith versus doe and the connecticut department of public safety versus doe the two cases that they looked at said that 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 harm is in fact there and it could be significant but it flows from the conviction which is already public now the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania gets around that by saying, well, that was early a generation before before the internet became as pronounced as it is today. And and therefore yes. we're 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 deviating from that. But but that doesn't mean that every every other state Supreme Court is going to follow suit. Certainly. I I I, I can totally get from two thousand three, five people were on the internet at the time, and now there are only five people that aren't allowed on the internet, and there are all are people that aren't on the internet at this point. That it's that's where it, it's a very big challenge. It's 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 a pretty big hurdle to get someone to go to the courthouse and look somebody up. Hey, I want to go look up the ten people that live in my neighborhood that are near me to see if they have uh, a sexual conviction in their history. That is correct. And, and so, but the internet just makes it. You know, people are sending you email blasts saying, "Oh, somebody moved into your neighborhood seven thousand feet away. You should be concerned about this." But 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 that in alone, it, 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 and I'm just playing devil's advocate here. Yeah. What? Well, well. But in colonial times, when 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 we information moved around the country, it moved by what? It moved by uh, what? Uh, the, 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 <laughs> the, the, well, the town crier, and it moved by the uh, the 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 horse and the, what they call the Pony Express. And then uh-huh. we then we had the telegra- telegraph. I mean, it, as 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 the means of moving to, uh, information has advanced, yes. that hasn't rendered. All, all until the internet came along, when we got to where we moved things by 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 a teletype, we moved it by fax machine. I mean, does does the fact that information is more readily available does that somehow does that somehow in and of itself change the fact that the information was always intended to be readily available? The courthouse is always intended to be open to the public. Does opening the courthouse to the public through 
technology, which you're usually so fond of all the time, does that somehow make that information uh, a, a, a non-public because it's more easily accessible? Well, a- as we find with most things in the, uh, the famous person named Hippocrates, that it's all fine and dandy until it affects you in a negative fashion. Then you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. We need to, we need to slow this train down. And while, yeah, I'm totally in favor of all the technology, all the time doing all the things un- until my name ends up on some website somewhere that someone then harasses me as I walk down the street one day. So, well, that's, that's, that's the point. I mean, the courts are struggling with that because conviction information has always been public and the harm from being on the registry. See, I don't take, I don't argue from that point. I argue from a different point. Yes, you're right. The, the fact of the conviction is, is readily available, should be readily available, unless we decide to go the European route, which uh, that would be kind of liberal do-goodism. But if we were to try to go the European route to where, where people have the right to be forgotten. But your conviction information does not include all the stuff that we put on the registry now. Your conviction information does not identify where you work. That's not a part of the conviction. So therefore, so we strike that. Your conviction information doesn't identify where you live. So therefore, we strike that. The conviction information does not identify what you drive. So therefore, we strike that. So we start striking everything. We get down to just the name of the offense you were convicted of, the date of conviction, and your mugshot, the date of conviction. Your conviction information does not include up-to-date photos of what you look like today. So we strike all the photographs that have been accumulated through the years. So if we just want to go literally by conviction information that's always been public, then we've got a different argument here. But requiring a person to come into a police setting and provide information that's not a part, was not a part of the conviction, and do that repetitively over and over again, and to be detained while they're fingerprinted, and then to have tremendous restrictions put on them in terms of where they can live and work, that's an entire different discussion than simply making the conviction. I maintain under present law, if you just simply said, okay, congratulations, you're registered. Let me snap a picture of you. This lives on the internet for the rest of your life. Go on and have a great life. I think that would be a constitutional registry. Although I don't, advocate for that. (laughs) But I think from a constitutional perspective, unless we change what the expectations of privacy are under our Constitution, I think that could constitutionally be done. And yeah, but but then, you know, mom down the street gets her panties in a wad because she doesn't know all of the details about the person that lives next door. She has no such right. And, that, and that's where FYP comes from. That's, that's exactly right. She has no such right to know that. And uh, to, uh, for, to my dismay, most people on the registry, when they ask, they are asked, don't they have a right to know? Well, they almost overwhelmingly say yes. They have, no, they don't have any right to know that. You have no right to know who lives in the dwelling next to you. Where does that right derive from? Tell me, cite that right. <laughs> There's no such yeah. right. I, I, yeah, I agree. I understand. It's just interesting because, because that, that, that reputation thing, and, and I, we have talked about it before because I didn't invent this idea in my head that Pennsylvania has this reputation thing in it. So I'm going to, like you said, uh, just take him on his word that it's there. All of this stuff then makes a, a very severe mark on your reputation by having all of your junk posted that you did a thing, you know, two weeks ago, and now your picture and address and, and Pennsylvania lists your work address too. That makes, life very challenging. Well, uh, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court is entitled to interpret their constitution any way they see fit. So if they if they see that the constitution is like the US Supreme Court when they invented the right to abortion. There's no such right for abortion. I'm not saying that we should we should not have abortions, but that was an invented right that 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 uh, uh, I forget what the count was in 73 when they decided Roe versus Wade, but that was that was an, a right that was stretched from within the right to privacy. So if the Pennsylvania yeah. Supreme Court has stretched and said, gee, the right to, 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 to privacy or some, some aspect of the Constitution it, it includes the right to reputation, that's fine. They can do that. But we can't go to we can't go to the Alabama Supreme Court and say, oh, well, now let me tell you this. Go good old boys down here in Alabama. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court has says there, there's, a, there's a right to, uh, to, to reputation. And they would laugh and they'd say, where's that in the Constitution? Certainly. <laughs> so fantastic for Pennsylvania. But, but in, in terms of this decision that I highlighted, 
uh, I don't remember doing all these highlights last time, but 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 I I went through and I did the Kennedy Mendoza factors of what determines for the regulatory scheme is 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 punitive despite it being labeled regulatory. Those seven factors were there on page eight, and I highlighted stuff about uh, the the presumption is that the statute is constitutional, all legislative enactments. And then I highlighted some stuff about uh, the uh, Supreme Court decision in, in Munez where they said that uh, yesterday's face-to-face shame, shame and punishment can now be accomplished online and individual's presence in cyberspace is is omnipresent. How do you pronounce that? It's not omni- omnipresent. Omnipresent. Yeah. The, pub, the, pub, the, the public internet website utilized by the Pennsylvania State Police broadcasts worldwide for an extended period of time the personal identification information of individuals who have served their sentences. This exposes registrants to ostracism, harassment without any mechanism to prove rehabilitation, even though, e- even through the clearest of proof. So, I've, and, and then I've got all the references they have to, to. They made their decision based on their superior court that that supervises them. That they felt their hands were tied. They say we we're bound by this precedent. So, so that that's that's what I took from the from the opinion. But it it, it it's all going to be decided by the Supreme Court very shortly. The state Supreme Court, that is. And, and um, I, if I recall right, unless that creates some sort of federal constitutional challenge, the state Supreme Court for Pennsylvania, that would be the end of that road. It would be the end if they, if they interpret this under their state constitution. The U.S. Supreme Court doesn't get the vote on the state constitution only if it's providing protections beneath the federal constitution. But states are free to provide protections greater than the U.S. Constitution. You just can't go beneath that. So, so, I understand. If, so if Pennsylvania wants to, to invent rights and say our Constitution provides for this, we, we find this in our Constitution, as long as it's a greater protection, there's nothing the Supreme Court can do about it of the United States. I mean, that's their, their prerogative to, to, to provide greater protections to their citizens than the U.S. does. Because it really doesn't, it doesn't matter what this court said. Because the Supreme Court has already heard oral arguments and it's waiting, it's waiting, it's it's submitted and it's waiting for their decision. All right, so then we will hit that sometime in the near future. Very good. And all right, well, Larry, can we move? Like, why did you put this Kabuki stuff in here about some governor sexual assault allegations? Kabuki, what's Kabuki about it? <laughs> you have some sort of axe to grind about allegations and people stepping down from office based on allegations versus actual like convictions or hard evidence and all this stuff. So there's something going on in New Mexico with uh, with accusations against. Is it like the running mate of the governor? Oh, it's the or governor. It's like the that? governor herself. Okay. The governor herself has been accused of sexual impropriety. Right. Okay, well, uh, this has this has completely confused me in terms of what the expectations are when there's an accusation, because heretofore I've been told by the on the progressive side that if 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 a person's accused, we immediately call for their resignations, and if we, if we look at all the damage that's been done in the in Hollywood. And, and 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 coaching and people that have been accused of stuff where they've lost their career based on allegations, uh, almost to the to the point of the Supreme Court justice not being confirmed, based on allegations that were decades old, decades yeah, old. Yeah, more in uh, whatever Alabama, Mississippi, whatever that was. Well, I'm talking about the U.S. Supreme Court with the confirmation. Yeah, yeah. yeah of, I was uh, just bringing up another example. That's yeah. All. But but, but uh, so so here we have the governor, sitting governor of New Mexico, has been accused of dumping water on a man's crotch who worked on her campaign and then laughing about it, grabbing his crotch. And I embellished a little bit. I said, and she said there wasn't much there, but I can't find that she actually said that. Uh, but but she has she has vigorously denied this allegation and she's proceeded to go on an attack of the guy. Now, I, I generally support this governor. I had great hopes for this governor. Uh, I think it was a refreshing change, refreshing change from the previous governor, who was a former prosecutor and who didn't know anything other than lock him up and throw away the key. That's but, not Gary Puff Johnson, is it? No, that was Susanna Martinez. Oh. Puff okay. has been out of office for a long time. <laughs> okay. But what I'm confused about is this governor, when she was seeking the Democratic nomination to be governor, she was afraid that she was going to have to run on the ticket with 
Senator Michael Padilla, who would announce for lieutenant governor. In most systems for governor, they don't select their running mate. They run independently, and then the 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 the, the person who prevails in the can, in the campaign for lieutenant governor nomination runs with the person who prevailed in, in the campaign for governor. So this governor was not governor at the time. She was our congressperson from the first district. She called on Senator Padilla to step down for allegations that he had sexually harassed a woman when he was running the Albuquerque 9-11, 9-11, excuse me, the 311 system that we have here. He set that up because he's in the call center business. And those allegations go back more than a decade. Oh, I, okay. You explained this to me earlier and I was very confused. I thought I had heard about allegations on the governor herself, but so, so the governor has been accused of something. She didn't step down, but now this other person has been accused of something and she's saying he should step no, down. No, 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 that's not the way it goes. He oh. was running for lieutenant governor in 2000, same time she was running. She was fearful that she would have to run with him on the same ticket. Yeah. And he had been accused of sexual harassment a decade ago when he worked for the city of Albuquerque. Right. So she demanded that he withdraw his candidacy uh-huh. for lieutenant governor. And he did. She went on to secure the Democratic nomination for governor. She went on to win the nomination, and she serves in the office of governor now. So as recently as 2017, she was accused – I mean, she was demanding that a person who had – a decade old of allegations that were not substantiated, step aside and not run for public office. Now, he's still in the state Senate. He was in the state Senate then, and he's in the state Senate now. But she was demanding that he step aside. So what confuses me is that now she's been accused of sexual impropriety, and she hasn't offered up her resignation. Not only has she not offered up her resignation, she has attacked this man. She said he's not credible. And I have always been told that when you attack the accuser, that you're re-victimizing them. This man is out of the state now because he fears for his safety. And I've always been under the impression, according to the victim's advocates, that we're supposed to protect the accused because they've been traumatized. And so what I don't understand is where does this break down at? Because now the accuser is being attacked and the accuser has left the state. And the accuser says that he fears for his safety. So I'm wondering if there's a gender difference when the accuser happens to be male. I'm wondering how do we determine if allegations are credible and when they're just assumed to be true and when we actually require evidence, because we haven't really required evidence for a whole bunch of people. We didn't require any evidence for 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 uh, for the senator in Minnesota, for Al Franken. We haven't required any evidence for a whole lot of people that have just been tossed aside because accusations have been made. So I'm deeply confused, and I want to play the game by the rules as I understand them. So I want to know those that are listening that can understand and explain these, either email or call in, and we'll have you on the podcast if you can explain to me when you get to attack the accuser, when is evidence needed, when do we get to declare that there's that, that a person's not credible for therefore they shouldn't be believed? And when is it when are you victimizing somebody? I mean, I always thought that anybody who made an accusation should be confronted. And I've always said that on the podcast that 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 you bear the burden of proving out your allegations. But apparently I was wrong, so I'm trying to get this straight. So write in to old curmudgeon at registrymatters.co. Is that your email address? <laughs> I thought it was crackpot. Right. So, so yeah, oh, that that, that, that's that would I, be easier. Crackpot would be easier. Uh, that's why I put this in here because I'm I'm really confused. Now, I'm not calling for the governor to resign. I'm just trying to figure out where the dividing line is on on this stuff. When when someone's accused, if the gender of the accuser is male and the accused is female, does that mean that 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 we automatically disbelieve the guy or guys? So that uh, I mean, are only women fragile? Or are only women uh, because if he's afraid for his safety, that's what a lot of women say that they're afraid for their safety. They don't come forward for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. I, I mean, and, can, and, can, and I thought it was okay to grab people's crutch. I thought that that's what they wanted. Well, we don't have any evidence other than his accusation. But now when it comes to sexual offenses, we're told that the accuser is all the evidence that's needed. He said that, that she did that. 
So I'm hoping what really comes out of this is that I'm hoping the governor and the people of that persuasion who believe that we should automatically believe people, I'm hoping they have a moment of enlightenment and they decide that we need evidence when accusations are made across the board and we don't automatically assume anything and we give people the benefit of the presumption of innocence, which is what this country is supposed to be built upon. That's what I would hope comes out of this, but I'm not so sure it will. Because they'll figure out a way to rationalize and, and say that they're, they're, this is different because. Well, of course they will. But in, but I mean, from from your take of this, this is uh, a, a very hypocritical position of an individual? I, I can't see anything other than this being hypocritical because this governor, she's recently Senator Martinez to step down. He got convicted of DWI again. Now, that's different because there has been a conviction. He was tried, not by a jury. He chose to, 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 to waive his, 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 and not assert his right to jury. But he, she's called for his resignation. Again, he serves in the legislative branch. He directly answers to his constituents. And if his constituents want to return him to office with a DWI conviction, that is entirely their prerogative. But if I were to do a little bit of research, I'd probably be able to find that she's called for other people's resignation. I'm just about guaranteed that she didn't want Kavanaugh confirmed based on the allegations that were decades, decades old. Yeah. So I, I'm just trying to I'm trying to be intellectually honest here, and, and I'm trying to figure out what the standards are. And it's not like the the so the, the one of the articles that you posted is from 2017. So like exactly two years ago, it's from November of 2017. Says. Is it Lujan, or how do you pronounce the first name? Which, or I, even that's the middle name. What's the governor's name? Luhan Grisham. Luhan. Okay, Luhan Grisham tells Senate leader to leave race. So that's, that's just two years ago. It's, it's not was, like something. That was, I mean, the, that was in the campaign for governor. She yeah. was afraid she was going to be stuck with him as her running mate. He had allegations a decade old that he had arrested a woman when he worked for the city of Albuquerque. Yeah. So she had no hesitation to say, Senator Padilla, get out of this race. Yeah. So I'm trying to understand. And, His allegations were not substantiated. He didn't get convicted of anything. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I guess the, the question that I'm trying to get at, and, and we can move on here after just a, in another brief moment. She has been accused of something. So by that, shouldn't she just say, hey, I've been accused. I should step down. That apparently was her belief on Padilla. And I'm trying to get clarification. Now, if someone from the governor's office is listening, I'd be happy for them to write into us. Uh, register matter, what is it? Registry matters.co. How do you get adults? Registry, registry matters, matters cast. cast at Gmail. Yeah, G, at Gmail. <laughs> uh, 109 episodes, you still don't have it right. Jesus. Uh, well, it's two o'clock in the morning. But, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I'd be happy. I'd be happy to hear their rational excuse for why. This is different. Interesting question. I do. I, 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 one of my most favorite subjects is people being hypocritical about things like it's okay if we talk about this all the time about, hey, if the benefits flow in my direction, it's okay. But if they flow in that direction, it's not okay. Well, and I strive to be a little bit more intellectually honest. And that's why I'm raising the question. I don't understand based on the standards that have been set. I don't understand why resignation wouldn't be in order. But I'm not calling for it because, like I say, I prefer her over the crackpot we had for eight years. But she's the one who set the standard. She's the one who asked for resignations. Right. I'm with you. Interesting. You know, it's, it's kind of like when, 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 when we criticize people who thump the Bible and then they get caught up in something. It's not because we expect them to be perfect. That's not the reason why. It's because when you are thumping the Bible and telling us we should live our lives and you have the moral high ground, and you get caught doing something you shouldn't be doing, that's why, where you get the criticism. We, we know that, that, that everybody's a flawed mortal, but when you're going to preach to me and tell me how I should live my life, you damn sure to be living yours by that preaching. Absolutely. Well, there are three links in there if anybody wants to go check out the show notes and, and, and tell us where Larry is smoking a crack pot or whatever it is. And uh, yeah, feel free. There is uh, the, the next thing that we're going to talk about is Arkans from the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, uh, Arkansas Online. Arkansas sex offender housing law raise, uh, laws raise hitch. With doors closed to them, many become homeless and difficult for states to track. That last part we've talked about a gajillion times. Wouldn't it be easier to track them if you knew their address instead of like the 17th bridge at mile marker 12 on Highway 101 or something like that? 
I also still can't figure out why it, how is it better for anybody to live outdoors somewhere? I, you know, uh, so Arkansas probably gets cold enough that you would want some sort of uh, coverage in the wintertime, but we are insistent that we need to make rules for people that they can't live within so many thousands of feet from school, church, daycare, library, public park, private park, <laughs> or anywhere the children are known to congregate. We make it impossible for them to find housing. Well, I, 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 I was very impressed with this article. It's on what we typically well not really compared to the appeal and some of those but it's a it's a long article and it's and it's well done uh balanced and they they cover it from all angles and and they have people from the sex offender registry they have they have sheriffs being quoted and they have uh, uh people from the assessment board that that do the risk arkansas has a risk-based system that puts people in four different categories and and the the categories determine what restrictions you may have in terms of housing and it's not a perfect system by any means i don't think humankind can devise a perfect system but at least it does afford some due process so those who are who are, are subject to residence restrictions have had due process now what the question i don't have answers for and there's two people from arkansas advocates robert combs and carlos swanson are quoted in the article i don't know if if in spite of their of their leveling system if they if they have restrictions to in order to release a person on parole if they apply those restrictions on level ones and twos i don't know the answer to that but if they're if they only apply that to level three and four theoretically you've had some due process but to answer your question is it better no of course it's not better and that's made apparent by the people in the article that are in the law enforcement saying you know it'd be a lot better if we if we had stability in these people's lives and, and uh it it's 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 sad that that despite all the evidence that that they continue to enact and expand residence restrictions all over the country and you know we always talk about people going to the legislator and that the uh law enforcement is so well represented i i, I know you i'm sure you don't know the answers but speculate don't you think law enforcement would have been there saying it would be better for us to be able to track these people some may have thought it, but it's difficult. Uh, you find the rare law enforcement officer that'll say that publicly. Uh, uh, they'll say it privately, but once in a while you'll have a renegade officer that'll say that. Uh, I think there was one from Oklahoma a few years ago, a decade or so ago, that was when they changed their law to 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 be to be more in line with the with the uh, uh, offense-based system rather than risk-based. They, uh, they criticized that, but. I doubt there's very many law enforcement officers speaking in hearings about uh, in opposition to this stuff. So they just they just let it go as uh, you know, they 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 say nothing in in response to something going through, even though they know it would be horrendous. And they have, you know, like do they have the bat phone? Do they have the red phone that goes right to the uh, the lawmakers' offices to tell them something is bad if they do it? Well, you you got to remember that the registry is largely uh, managed across the country by local law enforcement, primarily elected sheriffs. And if the sheriff himself or the chief deputy or the command structure, they may be enlightened, but if 75, 80% of the residents in your county believe this makes them safer and you start talking against uh, uh, residency restrictions, that's not going to bode well for you being reelected sheriff. So that, so that, that's a, that's a major inhibiting factor in having having honest discussion in public they don't want to find themselves on the news saying that sheriff so-and-so from crittenden county said that the registry restrictions are bogus and not based on anything other than raw emotion They're, they don't want to be on the news uh, saying that i have heard completely anecdotal from from miscellaneous people that they are able to have various degrees of candid conversations with their handlers and the the local popo folks that are doing the registration stuff that they hate it they they this is a a crazy burden for them they know that it doesn't uh doesn't do any good and i i shared with you i don't know it was maybe six weeks ago two months ago uh i got a knock on my door pretty sure it was a saturday morning it could have been a sunday morning and a big freaking uh you know Smokey the bear hat kind of thing uh, he's like, Hey, I need to give you this so that, you know, it's an updated procedure for your annual registration. And 
I don't even know how we got on the subject. Dude was super friendly is, is one point. Um, he happened to actually knock on my neighbor's door first by accident. And, uh, he's, you know, there's 300 or something people where I live on the registry. And he says, yeah, out of all of them, maybe two of them would actually need to be watched. You know, so maybe, you know, just a handful of these people out of the 300 or so would actually need to be watched. We are, there's an exorbitant amount of resources being wasted in this kind of monitoring that doesn't seem to, to do anything, but the public still wants it. Well, and, and there was a quote from the governor uh, in response to an email that the Gazette asked for uh, for a quote from the governor, which is Asa Hutchinson. And, and uh, a quote, I do believe, this, this, this is this is an um, email response to the newspaper's questions. I do believe the public needs to be aware of the location of, of high-level sex offenders in order to assure that children are adequately protected. Uh, and, and, and a statement attributed to Hutchison. So the governor himself is saying that he believes that that it, that it serves some benefit. But isn't isn't that even specifying? And, and I don't want to get into the conversation about the different levels, but high-level sex offenders. So not. Not the statutory rape, not the uh, not the uh, Romeo and Juliet ones, but like the actual evil people. And I'm not trying to go down that path, really. But there there is a distinction there between the people that are and aren't on those high level risk assessments. Well, but see, there again, that's where for people have people out there uh, just assume because in their mind their offense was very benign that they're going to be on a risk based system come in low. That is not the experience that we have with the states. You can have non-contact offenses and you can be rated level three and four. Right, yeah. So so the, 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 this presumption is, well, all I did was look at child porn. They're gonna have me level one. No, mm-hmm. they're not gonna have you level one. The person quoted in this story, Robert Combs, he's a level He's a level three, last time I checked. Okay. And, 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 and so you, it's a misnomer to think that, that just because you're a high level, it could be that you have more than one offense that, that could put you at a high level that, 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 you've, that you've not shown a propensity to control yourself. You might have had 500, 700, 1,000 images. Uh, you know, it may, uh, but, but, but we can't conclude just because you're at a high level, like the governor said, that, that makes you a, 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 a stalking mad rapist that went out and, 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 and grabbed people off the streets because there's, so there's so few of those actually out there that if we truly went, if we truly went to, to, to that level of registration, the registers would shrink so much because there are very few people like that are on the streets to begin with. Yeah, it's all it's two or three or four percent, some some ridiculously low single digit percentage number of the 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 uncontrollable kind of people. Yeah, and most of them are in prison. Yeah, I'm with you. But but but, uh, the, but yeah, and if they're not in prison, then they're controlling themselves. So the the uh, the. The uh, person at ACIC, the Arkansas Crime Information, because Paula Stitz, uh, she said the offender is mad, doesn't have a home, and is blaming the world. That's not a good mental state, and uh, so, so she's even recognizing that they need that need to have to, you know to be housed. Yeah, I mean, it makes no sense to me that that with uh, the vast resources of the United States, that we can't create housing for all people, including those that we deem highly undesirable. Well, in this case, it's not even. I mean, I agree with you uh, mostly on that. But in this case, it's not. In this case, it's it's that they're not allowed to live in places. This is where capitalism breaks down because people have the money. In many cases, they're not allowed. Only five percent, according to this article of North Little Rock, is available. There's some slivers of land in North Little Rock yes. of, of available for for sex offenders. So it's not a question. I mean, it, that that is a factor for people who don't have money because they can't they can't get a job. But there are people who have resources who cannot live in a place because of the banishment. Indubitably. And what is the solution? I mean, like the solution I, is very we, simple. We, the solution is really simple. In the land of the United States of America, people should be able to live any place they want to live that they can afford to live. That's the solution. It's so simple that even even a, a third grader could do it. What does that show? Are you smarter than a fifth grader? I believe so. Yeah. So even a fifth grader can figure this out. Ironically, hosted by Bill Cosby. So yes, uh, I don't remember that. He's he was already out of business before that show was aired. I he was the host of that show. No, he wasn't. I'm almost positive. No. Oh, no, somebody says Jeff Foxworthy. Never yeah, mind. Definitely. You know what? It, the show that I'm thinking of was the kids say the darndest things. Whatever. Yes. 
Got it. Never mind. All right. I've been corrected by chat and by you. So, yeah. So, but, but that's the solution. It's like when people say, what do we do in all terms of the registry? We do absolutely nothing. We do what we do to everybody else who commits a crime. When they pay the debt to society, they're renewed. If they break the law again, we lock them up again. That's what we do. Yes. It, but by was, that time, people have been harmed, Larry. That is the price for a free society. We don't do preventative measures. We do the preventative while they're being punished. But once they've Have you punished, seen the movie Minority Report, Larry? No. But but once they okay. once their punishment is complete, they start with a slate again and they get the opportunity to offend again. I, I have a Patreon goal for us then. When we hit some number, we can talk about it later. When we hit some number, we will watch uh, a Minority Report and we will discuss the uh, principles outlined in that movie. All righty. Well, let's move over to Wisconsin State Public Defender requiring internet identifiers on sex offender registrants does not violate First Amendment. Why would this even possibly violate the First Amendment? Why would it possibly? Well, because, well how, how would it? Because yeah, go it, ahead. Because it could have a chilling effect on, 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 the, on those who would wish to speak. Do you have a right to speak anonymously in the United States? That's what I've always uh, believed. That you you do have to. It kind of it's one of those things that kind of goes without saying. If the if if the government can chill you from speaking, then then we have less of of, of a representative republic. If you if you if you're able if the government is able to identify its critics and stifle the, the critics, then we would we would not have. It's kind of like when the news media vanishes, which is doing very rapidly these days. When we don't have leather on the ground walk into city council chambers and listen to what's say, being said and asking tough questions and asking for documents so they can so they can report to the public when that goes away then part of our democracy dies so you could let's try can we make a fit, real world analog could you go visit your local town hall meeting with a mask on and speak in a way, I mean, I guess using like the telephone, you could call from a payphone, or, or you know, if you could figure out where a payphone was, and you could call your representative and speak your mind, and remain anonymous. And that does not exist if you have to give up all of your identifiers to your local handlers. Well, that's that's the theory. This decision that we're going to talk about uh, uh, makes 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 uh, a, a counterpoint. But but that's that's the, that's the theory. That's why we have case law coming from different directions on this issue. Some, sometimes it's found to have a chilling effect and sometimes not. In this case, it was found that uh, that having to, re, re, to to produce your identifiers is, is not, doesn't violate the Constitution. And this is the Court of Appeals for Wisconsin, so there's still another level to go yet. Can you give me your opinion on this? I know you're not like the biggest of internet users, but what would be your opinion on if this does have a chilling effect on your freedom of speechness. Well, again, this this uh, this decision is uh, I've got a lot of highlights on what I went through it, and uh, this this person uh, he 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 makes he makes uh, a good case, but he made a strategic error early on <laughs> that 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 foreclosed him from being able to make the, the proper challenge. He pled no contest to. To, uh, uh, to 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 uh, uh, to uh, to an offense, and 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 then he filed a post conviction motion arguing that that the section of the law that requires him to give up these identifiers is unconstitutional as applied to him, and that it's facially overbroad. So those, those are two separate constitutional claims. That that it, that it, that it's uh, uh, an as applied challenge. Is different than a facial challenge, and we talk about that all the time. A facial challenge means there's no set of circumstances which something can be done, and that's why the registry will never be found to be unconstitutional because there is a set of circumstances when you could have a registry that would be constitutional. Therefore, the courts will never say that the mere act regent of itself is unconstitutional. But back to this point uh, of this case, he waived his as applied challenge by pleading. No contest, which is essence guilty, because when you do a plea, you waive almost everything, and he waived an as applied challenge. Now, what is an as applied challenge? That means that that something could be constitutional, 
but it might not be constitutional as applied to you. So that be that would be an example would be something that was imposed imposed retroactively. You could make something unlawful, and if the police said, "Well, we're going to uh, prosecute you under this," you would say you, your first would be a constitutional ch challenge that this is unconstitutional as applied to you. Uh, uh, so he he for he 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 foreclosed himself on the as applied challenge by by pleading, and then he he argued over breath, which is one that's really tough to prove. But over breath exists when something it sweeps too broadly into into an area where you could be you couldn't pass a law that says you can't touch a minor on their butt, because people do touch minors on their butt for very legitimate reasons. Right. So therefore. Such a law would be un, would would be would be over overbroad. I generally think about overbroad as being in, in the area of, of of speech. But you could, when you pass a law that sweeps into and infringes upon uh, what's 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 what is is lawful behavior, then you have an overbreadth argument. So he he argued that this was over overly broad. Well, this court doesn't see it that way because they see it they see it as being narrowly tailored. And 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 uh, they they found that it deserved intermediate scrutiny rather than strict scrutiny because it's not a content-based restriction. They're not telling you that you can't say something, which is which is those those are presumed invalid when when the government restricts content of speech. Uh, but uh, intermediate scrutiny scrutiny in order to survive intermediate scrutiny, this is in one page three. A law must be narrowly tailored to serve significant government but governmental interests. In other words, the law must not burden substantially more speech than necessary to further the government's legitimate interest. Well, the court found in this case that it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't do that. It does not burden anymore because it, they contrasted it with Packingham, which he argued. Well, according to Packingham, they said no. Packingham forbids you to be on the internet. This yes. doesn't. This doesn't forbid you to be on the internet at all. This simply says you need to provide the identifier, so you can be on the internet all you want to. Then they compared it to a Georgia case that said uh, that was in the federal court in Georgia. They said, well, he, he argued that that it violated because, well, they said no, doesn't compare there because in Georgia, in Georgia you had to give up your passwords and you had to report much faster. In Wisconsin, you have ten days to report these these identifiers. I think we talked about it in Virginia. Somebody said it's a half an hour. Yeah, but, but it, 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 in this in this instance, you've got ten days, so you can speak anonymously for ten days. Yeah, you could presumably make an account, do all your nasties, and then purge the account. Well, but you could also speak anonymously against 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 Obama for ten days. Yeah, so it doesn't stifle right. you. So, uh, so uh, okay. So uh, uh, the the court found in this case that that the that it doesn't burden that you've got ten days. So you can speak all you want to, you can use the internet all you want, and then they found that the statute, since it restricts specifically, it says in the statutory language that that the that the internet does, does these are not made available to the public. These are available for law enforcement, and so they 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 cited that difference. They said since this is these these uh, identifiers are only for law enforcement purposes and they're not made available to the public. That 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 does not that 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 does not significantly impair the person's ability to speak. So so this court uh, at the appellate level says that that this is just fine. All right. So Wisconsin, you guys have to uh, give up your identifiers. Well, I don't, know if this is, I don't know if it's under appeal. This decision just has come out, so 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 it, it will likely be appealed. I'm guessing. Not by the state. They're, that's happy, by, they're happy with it, but but, the, but yeah, of course. So so the individual would have to, which you know means more court costs and all that fun stuff. Uh, they they even tried to cite the Nebraska case where in Nebraska the district court found problems. When Nebraska required you to consent to uh, 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 internet monitor, uh, monitoring by soft software, just for being on the registry, not as a condition of your supervision, but just simply being on the registry that you had to that you had to uh, 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 have have. Uh, and that you that you had to 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 notify them. I got this highlighted on page eight. It says uh, Jackson points to Doe's versus Nebraska, arguing that the internet site maintained by the sex offender registry, like a blog, poses no conceivable threat to the public. And Nebraska, 
the district court for the considered the statutes that require sex offenders to register electronic communication identifiers, addresses, domain names, internet, and blog sites used. The court determined that the statutes were insufficiently narrowed as it clearly chills offenders from engaging in expressive activity that is otherwise perfectly proper. And more importantly, the statutory requirement to disclose their identifiers was intertwined with a requirement that registrants consent to a search of their computers and allow law enforcement to install hardware or software to monitor the person's internet usage on all computers, electronic communications devices possessed by the person, thereby forcing the offender to choose between his or her First Amendment rights or his Fourth Amendment rights. The Nebraska statute also required the offender to inform the state about all blogs and internet sites maintained by the person or to which the person has uploaded any contact, content or posted any messages. The court took issue with that requirement, specifically noting that requiring internet identifiers and addresses, including designations for purposes of routing or self-identification as permitted by the Federal Attorney General's guidelines is one thing. Requiring sex offenders to consent to constantly update the government about when and at where they post content on internet sites uh, and blogs is entirely a different thing. So, so they said, we don't require that here in Wisconsin. So therefore, that yeah. argument doesn't work for you. Now, that would be a pain in the behind to go do, uh, you know, you could go to your local TV station website, which is effectively a blog, and go post comments. And now you have to p tell them every time that you would go post that. And I know you're talking about that's from Nebraska, but good grief, that would be a pain in the behind. Bad. So, but then they cited uh, on down on page eleven. They cited that uh, Tenth Circuit case, and then they cited sta Texas statute that uh, uh, that 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 doesn't impair the offenders. This is one of those things where there's going to be de conflicting decisions around around the, the country, and we're not going to get a clear answer unless the Supreme Court of the U.S. weighs in on on this particular issue. Uh, what like? <laughs> Sorry to, to, sorry to cross post over back to this Nebraska thing that you were just describing. And so you tell them that you've posted this stuff, like they're going to now go monitor, like they have now checked that your political speech is appropriate. I mean, I realize that they're just looking to make sure that you're not trying to post naughty pictures somewhere, but like, why would you tell them that you've posted naughty pictures anyway? You would just purposely hide that information from them. Well, they, that never got off the ground. That was enjoined before it ever, ever uh, the, the the federal judge granted an injunction, and then and then ultimately, upon trying the case, he decided that they couldn't do that. But I think it's still in the statute. I don't think they've ever re, uh, removed that from the statute. So if you look at Nebraska sex offender registration statute, uh, you'll see in there that 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 those those provisions are still in existence. Last time I looked. That's crazy. But on paragraph 26, we conclude that Wisconsin statute, and I'm not going to read the number, survives intermediate scrutiny and is not overbroad. In addition to the above, we further note that the statute neither unnecessarily chills anonymous speech, nor does it operate as a prior restraint on speech, as it does not require the registrant to update the registry information prior to engaging in protective speech or disclose law enforcement to law enforcement every time he or she updates content on a website. So there you have it. Very well. All right. Shall we move over to Tennessee and their crazy uh, craziness? Sure. All right. So this is just uh, in the last, like this came out yesterday. T Tennessee legislation will require certain sex offenders to undergo chemical castration. Uh, this is not cool, man, that they would make you for a condition of parole, I guess it is, that you will, you will take a, a pill that has a multitude of terrible, terrible, terrible side effects that you would take something that would make you not be interested in the naughty things. Well, that's up for debate in the Citizens Assembly in Tennessee, isn't it? Uh, yes, and uh, so I've already been corrected. It says no such thing as parole for those who commit uh, crimes against those under 12. I think and I guess, I, I, yeah, and I guess this would be, uh, so you get to pick either, uh, I guess you get to choose, right? So you can refuse this if you want to, right? Absolutely. All right. And what are the consequences of you uh, refusing? You'll serve out the totality of your sentence. I don't, God, let's see. So most, many, many people say that I would do anything to get out, you know, pick your day. So even like a day early or a year early or 10 years early, to what degree would you go? And doesn't, wouldn't this violate a constitutional challenge of, I mean, I realize that you're volunteering to take it and you can opt to not take it, but like to be forced to take some kind of medicine, either by shot or by pill to maintain some kind of level of freedom. Well, we're going to have to wait and hear from the courts, but I don't see how something is voluntarily, uh, uh, 
I don't see how that would violate the Constitution. You're yeah. be because yeah, because you okay. can refuse to take it. The, right? the parole board comes to you and they hand you a litany of things and they say we will grant you early release from prison if you will agree to this list of things. And there are oftentimes people find things on on the list objectionable, and they say I won't agree to that. And they say okay, sure, that's fine. You can you can I, I mean, stay it, with it, us. as a right, yeah, you can stay at the uh, the, the Holiday Inn here. Um, I you know I mean I guess. Is it is it fair to say okay you won't drink alcohol? Is that a fair comparison? Here you have to take this pill, and you also don't drink alcohol. And if you can't agree to these two terms, then you get to stay here at the Holiday Inn. Well, I mean this is this is relatively new, so we're going to have to ha- we're going to have to have litigation. We're going to have to develop some parameters. We uh, the average person that that's given this option is choosing it under a great deal of duress. So we're going to have to we're going to have to deal with that. We're going to have to deal with are there medical side effects from this particular medication? I don't know anything about this medication, and I doubt the person who's going to take it knows a whole lot about it. So we're going to have to we're going to have to have courts decide if they can present this as an option to people. It if, if it's if it's if the side effects and the adverse effects are known to be a disaster, then this may should be removed from the option for, uh, a list of options from uh, put on the table. But if this law passes, the assembly in Tennessee, which it did in Alabama, signed by the governor, it is presumed to be constitutional because the people's representatives and the people's executive are presumed to care about the Constitution because they put their hand on the Bible and they said they were going to uphold it. So therefore, it gets a great deal of deference. So only the clearest of proof is going to knock this down because it has been enacted in Alabama and it's now in consideration under consideration in Tennessee. We have covered this uh, this uh, drug before, it, maybe not this specific one, but this particular process and the a number of side effects. I, I, I seem to recall something along the lines of cancer kind of things was uh, a much greater degree of risk of having cancer kind of side effects to go along with this. Uh, and I want to say that this is borderline like junk science that this sort of kind of works it has the desired outcome but not necessarily exactly what you were intending like well, the side effects the unintended consequences are, are huge absolutely like i said we're going to have to have litigation but right now in alabama the law the governor signed it and it will be a burden to prove a very high burden to meet this is not presumed unconstitutional it's presumed constitutional and absent the clearest of proof, this will stand, and people will be put in that choice, a uh, position of making a choice if they would like to be released from prison early. If they do, they will have to agree to this if they have if they have a victim under that under that age range. Uh, so we this have, is draconian, there. It is draconian, but but there's other things. I mean, what about these things that they're strapping on people? I mean, I don't know a great deal about radiation, and I, I know we joke about it a lot, but I don't know what type of, 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 of stuff is being beamed into your body. And if, if, there's, if, if, if people are going to be developing any side effects from having to wear these devices for years and years and years, I don't know that. Do you? Oh, you're talking about like a GPS monitor? Yeah, like all these electronic devices. Yeah. We don't, yeah. Know, we don't know the long-term harm of that, do we? We do not. There, there are reports of, like, of people using cell phones for hours and hours and hours a day, but and those, all, all those reports come back and say it's complete bunk, nothing happens. Oh, well, but this this will have to go through the courts. But you, Tennessee, it's time for you to speak up because now it's on the table. Right. Yeah. All right. And then I guess to close out the show, we have a little bit of a listener question that you get to do uh, your, your Larry analysis on. And this is from, uh, from uh, I'm not going to read the whole email address, but Rick says, uh, have you heard of the very recent Tenth Circuit decision, U.S. versus Michael Blair? It seems to greatly contradict the Eighth Circuit's decision in U.S. versus Kevin Carson regarding internet use and other blanket probation restrictions. I would love to hear about it on Registry Matters podcast, and thank you for all you do. Thank you very much for the question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so it would seem that in one of the circuits, one person had all kinds of junk piled on them, and then another circuit, another one didn't have all those uh, restrictions piled on. And then we have a huge amount of controversy, conflict between the two circuits. And wouldn't that almost like initiate a challenge that would go up to uh, the Supreme Court? Well, it, it certainly would be something you could put in your cert petition 
is you're one of the 9,000 each year who, who submits those petitions, knowing about 80 to 90 of them are going to be elected, you could certainly put that in there. And that's a factor that's uh, known to, to encourage them to select your case for review. It's no guarantee. Um, what happened? So which one, which one was which? Um, who had more and who had less restrictions? The Tenth Circuit is the more favorable and uh, the listeners in. Uh, and I really, uh, I think I saw the Tenth Circuit. So I'm in the Tenth Circuit. I think I've glanced at this one. So I glanced at it again and I made some, 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 some uh, markings in it, not all through the whole 31 pages, but I, but I made some appropriate mark early on in, in, in it, some highlights. And supervised release, I think most people have heard me say this before, that the statutory provisions provide a relevant part that a trial court may order special conditions of supervised release so long as, one, the conditions are reasonably related to the nature and circumstance of the offense and the history and characteristics of the defendant, the need to afford adequate deterrence to criminal conduct, the need to protect the public from further crimes of the defendant, and the need to provide the defendant with needed educational, vocational training, medical care, and other correctional treatment in the most effective manner. And then it cites the United States Code section. And then the condition, the, the other component of that, the other prong of that is that the conditions involve no greater deprivation of liberty than is reasonably necessary for deterring criminal activity, protecting the public, and promoting a defendant's rehabilitation. So that gives them an awful lot of latitude in imposing conditions. When you, when you, when you, when you have a special condition, the district court judge has a lot of latitude. But in the Tenth Circuit, the condition that that was was vacated was the condition that that allowed no internet that access throughout the period of supervised release unless approved by the probation officer. The court found that that meant potentially that the person would never have access to the internet, and that was too much power to afford a probation officer. The Eighth Circuit found just the opposite. So he's correct. The Eighth Circuit found that that based on their body of case law that had developed in the Eighth Circuit, that they that 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 they would provide the, the probation officer the, the the ability totally ban someone from the internet. And in the Tenth Circuit, they cited three cases where they had found the opposite. Uh, they cited United States versus White, where they overturned a condition that prohibited the defendant from possessing a computer with internet access. Uh, through a period of supervised release, that was a 2001 decision. Now, when we talk about body of case law, we we're talking about over a period of time. So they found they they cited that. Then they cited United States versus Walser, which they which came out uh, later. Not seeing the year on that, but then further down, they cited United States versus Altman, which came out in 2015 in the Tenth Circuit. And so they cited their body of case law that said just the opposite. So they. They typically don't undo a previous panel's work. So there's three cases on point. And this panel, this three judge panel said, yep, that's what the circuit, that's what the law of this circuit is. They, the probation officer cannot have the authority to blanketly restrict someone from, from without ever having access to the internet that is it's necessary for modern life. So we do a split between Did the tenth. Didn't something similar happen with the same-sex marriage stuff? What was that, like 2013, where you had different areas saying that it's okay, others saying it's not okay. So then the hand got forced, and it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled saying, hey, you know, they, they smashed their gavels and said, okay, same-sex marriage is legal. They forced their hand, and they I, I would assume that the, the, the opponents to it, they didn't get exactly what they wanted. That is correct. The, 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 the reason why the... the same-sex marriage proliferated to the entire country was because the issue was taken up by the conservatives. They wanted they wanted to to have their day in the Supreme Court because they knew that they could win it, or so they thought. But they didn't they didn't calculate that Justice Kennedy was not with them. So when they counted their votes, they were wrong. But sometimes you don't want the answer to a question. If you're in a tenth circuit right now, and you fear the Supreme Court, which I would tend to have my trepidation about them. I think Packingham does not carry the day. Uh, you know, the, the, as much as you want to read into Packingham, I don't think Packingham carries the day necessarily. It certainly is a good step in the right direction. But if you're in the Tenth Circuit and you've got the law of the circuit being that the PO can't do that, 
you don't want to have that risk of the Supreme Court reversing. And because if they were to undo that and say, well, actually, the PO can do that with the right, uh, with, with, uh, under the right circumstances, they can, then you've gone backwards in the Tenth Circuit. But the Eighth Circuit, they have nothing to lose. They have nothing to lose, so they'd be chomping at the bit. So if you if you if you if you're on if you in anywhere in the Eighth Circuit, you're going to file your cert petition and you're going to cite this uh, this conflict and you're going to say, look, I mean, this is a matter of great public import. Uh, this this is such a significant split, and this is so important because it's the First Amendment. And by golly, we need some clear, concise direction. Is it's exactly what you're going to do? And then the Tenth Circuit people now get dragged on this train ride that they don't want to be on. That's, that's always what potentially happens. So it's like what, what was the Sixth Circuit with uh, with those versus Snyder, when uh, okay. when, when people were wanting the Supreme Court to weigh in and the Supreme Court declined to 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 to, to take that invitation. The people that that handled the case for the ACLU and the the law school, the, the clinical law program. They were they were nervous as all as as they could be about the possibility the Supreme Court might undo their victory. They're happy with the law of the circuit of the sixth being the way it is. I, I I'm inclined to then think that the natural progression then is that we need to organize and have some kind of legal strategy department so that uh, we can figure out a way to as much as possible appease both parties in this to make the tenth happy or somehow happy that you know they should have an improved condition. Or excuse me, not have a a reduced condition, and then the Eighth Circuit people can somehow file a different way to challenge something to improve their condition. But we need some sort of larger hierarchy of uh, legal strategy. There's really no way they can challenge it. The last avenue of, of appeal would be from the Eighth Circuit to the U.S. Supreme Court. So there's nothing else left for them to do, and that's the, the avenue they'll take. Right. And, and, I mean, I, I guess what I'm saying then is to even create some kind of new challenge to just start a whole new a whole new process. But so their their hand is forced then that they have to then go to the Supreme Court and the Tenth Circuit people don't want them to do it. Well, uh, the Tenth Circuit and any other circuit where there's where there's similar case law uh, on this three judge panel on, on, on the Tenth Circuit. I noticed I just I flipped down to dissent. I, I didn't get time to read it in time for the show prep. But uh Judge Bobby Baldock, which he said as a district judge in New Mexico, he's he's about the most conservative judge you could ever imagine, and he dissented in part and concurred only only in part. So I'm going to try to read that. We'll get back to it on a future episode about what Baldock had to say. But Baldock, when he was a district judge, he believed in maxing everybody out, and he had two speeches he would give, and one was if you're a first time offender, he needed to send a message to you to not to break the law, so he would impose a very harsh sentence. And if you're a repeat offender, his speech was slightly varied, that, that, that imposing a very harsh and oftentimes the max was that you've had a previous chance and you didn't learn your lesson. So either way, you're going to get maxed mm. out by, by the ball dog. <laughs> so, um, wow. That sounds awesome to me. We should make longer maximums then. That way he would get he would be even happier about maxing people out. Well, of course, he's at the circuit level, so he doesn't impose sentences yeah. anymore. But, but it, when he was a district judge, he was pretty tough. I don't really understand it. I do not understand this philosophy, Larry, that we have other countries that we would, you know, compare ourselves to as far as economics and 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 happiness and and all that, and we 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 trash people in prison for for very long people's periods of time. I do not understand. Yeah, we continue to have a higher crime rate, so apparently we are not able to grasp that our approach isn't working. I understand. I think that we can uh, we could close out the show, Larry. Is there anything else that, that we need to do before we get out of here? This will be one of our shorter ones. We've only done three hours tonight. That is correct. Uh, well, I, I, well, you can find the show notes over at registrymatters.co. You can call in 747-227-4477. I said that really fast. If you want to hear it again, go find the show notes or press rewind. And we record the show usually on Saturday nights at 7 o'clock, but... That won't be the case next weekend either. But the best thing you could do for us, Larry, do you know what the best thing you can do for us is? Of course. It's to, uh, it's either your gross or net pay. To <laughs> no. Share the podcast. Share it, share it, share it, share it, share it with all the people you know. And yes, if you want to support the podcast, go over to patreon.com slash registry matters. And that's all I got, Larry. I hope you have a super splendid evening and I will talk to you soon. And follow us on Twitter. Follow us on Twitter. You're starting to do some tweets, aren't you? I, I have been doing tweets, but I'm trying to do more of them. All right. Well, well have evening. a good night, Larry. I'll talk good to you evening. soon. Thank you.